you know, C60 is just becoming more and more popular, and it just, like, it screams Nobel Prize to me. Right. Uh, just this technology in general. You know, so what, what are y'all's, you know, thoughts on all that? And, and Yeah, so it, it, C60 and C60 in olive oil, is it's based on Nobel Prize winning chemistry, right? So Dr. Richard Smalley won the Nobel Prize. Uh, that was about 96 Six. that he ended up winning the Nobel Prize. Interestingly, it's it's it took him ten years from the discovery, approximately ten years from the discovery, uh, to winning the Nobel Prize, and that's the shortest one of the shortest time frames from discovery to Nobel Prize uh, of of any Nobel Prize award. Yeah, uh, and and they kind of knew really quickly. The reason is because they knew really quickly that that C sixty would was just going to be have an amazing impact on society. Right, their thinking was. Uh, one of the building blocks of most chemistry is the benzene ring, and their thinking was, well, this is just kind of a 3D version of a benzene ring, and so you take all the chemistry that we already understand about benzene, apply that to C60, a 3D version of benzene, and so this is just going to be phenomenal. And, you know, as as it's kind of turned out lately, we're seeing some pretty f- phenomenal things, uh, even as it comes to, to health, so... So um, you've got some some pretty interesting stories because you met you went over and met the guys uh, who who actually in, in, you know in, gave you guidance on building the first reactor, but there's some interesting stories behind the scenes on on how it was first discovered. Um, you want to share some of that? Yeah. So Richard Smalley was had a lab. Uh, he specialized in laser ablation of things in his mass spectrometer. By the way, I saw a comment on YouTube, and it's like, classic scientist, if you don't know what to do with it, shoot it with a laser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he did, right? Yeah, so he's doing that research, and uh, Harry Kroth, though, uh, astrophysicist, astrophysicist yeah. wanted Richard Small to put some carbon powder and hit it with a laser and, you know, and see what comes out, because he theorized there's carbon floating around out in space. Well, Richard Small is like... I don't want to waste my time because I got this carbon powder in our reactor. No, in our mass spectrometer, it's hard to clean out. It's a big mess. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. You know, but from, Harold Croto came like three times. I think it was on the third time. Right? Yeah, and then so I understand that one of the postdocs said, "Hey, I'll put it in over the weekend. Richard Small is gonna not be here. I'll put it in. You know, we'll see what happens." Well, to put it in, and the same peak kept on popping up at seven hundred twenty. AMU, mass spectrometer, every time, over and over again. They came, why does this peak pop up every time, over and over again? And so... And so if you're thinking about what they were thinking at the time was that, okay, I've got, basically you would shoot a laser at a, a target, in this case carbon, use a puff of inert gas and take the, the what was ablated, laser ablated, into a mass spectrometer and then identify it. And so it knew that there were 60 carbon atoms in this particular structure if, if you had bunches of sheets of graphite, right, because graphite really at that time came in graphite sheets and in diamonds, so if you've got these sheets, why would a, a sheet of 60 be more common than a sheet of 61 or 63 or whatever? And so that postdoc actually tweaked the machine and was able to even in, further enhance that C60 peak. Um, and so that was just yeah. crazy. Yeah, uh, so I think over the course of a couple of weeks, they uh, sketching out the full ring ball on a, on a napkin, drinking some beer. Yeah. And so they, hey, we made a brand new molecule out of carbon. So before there's only diamond and graphite, two physical form of carbon. Now they got a third form of carbon, which right. gave the physicists and chemists around the world, you know, a big kick in the pants. Yep. There's a new form of carbon. Well, and, and there's, a, there's kind of two things to add. One, um, IBM actually had the same data, right? So they had a similar machine or the first machine. So they had the same data with the same peak and they just wrote the C60 off as anomaly. So it was pretty interesting to be at some of these, oh, yes, some of yes. the symposiums where like you've got IBM staff at the time standing up and saying, no, it's not a buckyball, it's not C60. And you've got kind of smallies entourage going, well, what else is it? That was literally like the you know intellectual debates about C60. It's just it's a fun you know the science is a phenomenal process and that's what's supposed to happen is people disagree and then you find studies that prove what you're gonna uh, what your theory is. Yeah, yeah, they, they disagree and say, well, let's work together. So that's how a lot of a lot of these scientists around the world start collaborating together and doing a research project. Uh, you know, and next thing you know, you have four or five different groups working on the same project from so around the world. One interesting thing. So prior to fullerenes. 
the symbol, the at symbol, right? So the one we use in our email didn't exist in chemistry. It wasn't necessary. So there's a new symbol in chemistry because of fullerenes. Uh, you know, C lanthanum at C60 means the, a lanthanum molecule. And by the way, every, excuse me, atom, every atom on the periodic chart can fit inside of the buckyball. So lanthanum at C60 actually means one lanthanum uh, uh, atom trapped, physically trapped. So not covalently bonded, not ionically bonded, but physically trapped That's inside of it. And it's pretty amazing. They theorized pretty early on that they could put like radioactive um, uh, atoms inside of buckyballs and then they could make some adjuncts onto the outside of a buckyball, get it to attach to like, I don't know, say a, a, a cancer infected liver and then that radioactive material might radi radiate that very specific cell and kill it. So that was theorized really, really early on. Yeah, that's uh, Fred Rudel out of uh, Santa Barbara. It's during the AIDS crisis. Right. And he would, uh, just wanted his, wanted his research topic. So he got his name because of that, uh, that the C60 molecule fit perfectly within the HIV virus structure. Yep. And, and would uh, block it from reproducing. Yeah. So that's a while back. So I really haven't followed his work since then, but that's, uh, he made his name at that one point. And that's an interesting point. So most of the people that, you know, in the early stages, you and I both went to conferences, uh, but I, you know, I kind of got focused on a different thing because it was a research market. And you, you've you been like, the reason there's an SES Young Investigator Award is because you attended all the Electrochemical Society meetings and they approached you not, you know, as a sponsor every time, but then they're like, hey, you're clearly invested in elect the Electrochemical Society. Would you be interested in sponsoring this uh, this award? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you're, you're like rubbed elbows. There's a photo in your in your desk of like all the lead fullerene scientists and, and you having dinner pretty pretty early on. So we should actually probably put that up on Facebook yeah. and kind well, of label I, everybody. Well, I bought beer for uh, uh, Harry Croto in, uh, in uh, uh, Sir Croto, right? Yes, yeah, Sir, right? He sir. was knighted. Yep, and uh, and helped in Crashmere. So I bought beer, beer, bought beer for these guys back in MIT. Uh, ages ago, yeah. and Huffman Crashmere were the ones who came up with the first way to 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 create um, macroscopic quantities of of C60. So it was that technique that we used in the early days to to produce fullerene soot, and then therefore C60. 